we will not be intimidated by these people. Confirmation battle. Lawmakers weigh the latest developments in the probe into Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh as President Trump mocks one of his accusers. Upstairs, downstairs, where was it? I don't know, but I had one beer. That's the only thing I remember. Catholics in America. An exclusive EWTN News Nightly poll asked the faithful about the U.S. political climate and approval of Donald Trump. Terminating the treaty. Why the United States is canceling a pact with Iran that dates from President Eisenhower's administration. And global gathering. The Vatican begins a meeting of bishops focused on youth while struggling to address clergy abuse scandals around the world. We're in Rome. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, October 3rd, 2018. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. President Trump ridicules the testimony of Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. She's the woman accusing Judge Brett Kavanaugh of sexual assault. The president is going on the offensive as the FBI continues to investigate allegations against the Supreme Court nominee. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. President Trump called Christine Blasey Ford's credible after she gave her account last Thursday. But now the president is casting that description aside and criticizing her lack of details surrounding the alleged 1980s assault. I had one beer. Well, do you think it was? Nope, it was one beer. Oh, good. How did you get home? I don't remember. How'd you get there? I don't remember. Where is the place? I don't remember. How many years ago was it? I don't know. I don't know. Last week, Ford recalled what she claims are specific details of the assault carried out by Kavanaugh. She alleges it happened in an upstairs bedroom during a house party. Kavanaugh denies it. The White House press secretary, Sarah Sanders, says Christine Ford doesn't have the corroboration to back up her claims. Them. Every person that she named uh, has come out and said either they didn't recall it or it didn't happen or they weren't there. Every single bit of evidence and facts that we've seen in this moment have supported Judge Kavanaugh's case. And the president simply pointed out the facts of the matter. Ford's attorney called the remarks from the president at a Mississippi rally last night a vicious, vile, and soulless attack on his client. Today, the White House is not disputing Christine Blasey Ford's testimony was compelling, but she is no longer being referred to as credible, as the president described her last week. The FBI could send Congress a report on its latest investigation into Kavanaugh's background as soon as today. Lauren. White House correspondent Mark Irons. Thank you, Mark. Just five senators could decide the fate of Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. Three wavering Republicans still undecided now criticize President Trump for mocking Christine Blasey Ford. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey has their reaction. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Lauren. Senator Jeff Flake, Susan Collins, and Lisa Murkowski are the three Republicans we're closely watching. Republicans only have 51 seats. That's just the number needed for Kavanaugh's confirmation. Now, all three say the president last night was wrong. The president's comments were just plain wrong. Republicans criticized the president for mocking the Senate testimony of Christine Blasey Ford. How did you get home? I don't remember. How'd you get there? I don't remember. Where is the place? I don't remember. How I don't like what the president said last night. I'm the first person to say, I want to hear from Dr. Ford. I thought she was handled respectfully. I thought Kavanaugh was treated like crap. Yeah, well, boo yourself. Senators say they'll vote this week on Kavanaugh's nomination. It's likely Judge Kavanaugh will greatly impede or eliminate a woman's right to choose. But first, the FBI investigates allegations against Kavanaugh. Democrats find reasons to criticize that investigation. Um, I've heard of many people who have offered testimony to the FBI and not been called. Uh, I have a constituent who, in fact, um, uh, wrote to me saying that she had not been called and wanted to be able to testify about what she knew about Judge Kavanaugh. Democratic leader Chuck Schumer says he wants the FBI report released publicly. 
Some Republicans say keep the details of it private, but release the general information. Yeah, I do want to see uh, some way to communicate what's in the report publicly. And you may get that information one way or another. Well, I'm not worried about leaks. I'm confident there'll be leaks. Uh, th somebody's going to say something of what comes out on it. That, that's not unreasonable. A man claiming to be Ford's ex-boyfriend reached out to the Judiciary Committee. He says he saw Ford coach a friend on how to be less nervous during a lie detector test. Now, if that's true, that would contradict Ford's testimony. See, she said she never gave tips on taking a lie detector test. Lauren? Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey. Thank you, Jason. Joining me now is Mona Sharon, Senior Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Mona, welcome back to the program. Glad to be here. Did President Trump undermine efforts to confirm Judge Kavanaugh with his personal attacks last night? Sure. You could see it in the faces of uh, and the comments of Susan Collins and Murkowski and Blake. Uh, this was just not helpful. The president had been restrained last week, saying she seemed like a fine woman and so on and so forth. Incredible. Incredible. Um, and now he has he could not resist, and he put his foot in it and made it into um, a, a bit of a clown show. And unfortunately, that does, yes, make it harder. And it makes it harder because? Uh, because um, he is he is playing into the stereotypes, right? He's mocking a woman who made very painful revelations about her experience. And um, anybody who then gets on board with that kind of treatment of women who come forward is going to get a backlash by a lot of people who think that this is an important moment in our society to change the way we treat women who have the courage to come forward. Do you think there's been a double standard in the way the public and the media have scrutinized both Judge Kavanaugh and Dr. Blasey Ford? Well, look, I, I do think that if the re if the parties were reversed, then the press, many members of the press on both sides would be saying the complete opposite, right? They would, um, you know, as we saw in the Clinton years, you know, people uh, who had been very worried about sexual harassment, suddenly when it was Bill Clinton, a lot of feminists and so forth came forward and said, oh, well, you know, it was consensual and there really wasn't any harm here and so forth. There's a lot of hypocrisy to go around, so um, I well, do think Well, this is Washington, yeah, after all. I mean, it's, you know, different same story. Same right? story. Yeah. <laughs> right. In the era of Me Too, do you think that there can be a rush to judgment in the desire to obtain justice? Yeah, so in up until now, I actually think that the Me Too movement has been quite a positive thing for our culture. And I think with a few exceptions, it has not gone too far, hasn't railroaded innocent men for the most part. But well, with Bill O'Reilly, there's a list of people who I think would disagree with you, but okay, They go might, ahead. but I'm willing to go out <laughs> okay, on a limb and okay. say that Bill O'Reilly got his just desserts. On the other hand, with Kavanaugh, you have seen this unbelievable explosion of allegations. The, for, I'm speaking not about uh, Ford, but which is a separate thing. But the other allegations that have been dredged up are so ridiculous, and, and they don't pass the smell test, and they really do reek of political advantage and trying to weaponize the Me Too movement and make it a, a partisan cudgel. We only have just 10 seconds to go, but I just want to know, do you think the contents of the report should be made public? Just as with raw FBI files that are often provided to members of Congress to help them make decisions, I don't think that the public should have access to just gossip, but to a, the general outline, yes, we had support, no, we didn't have support for her allegation, yes. Excellent. Thank you. Mona Sharon, Senior Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Thanks, Thanks. for joining us. We're unveiling a new series tonight that you'll see only on EWTN News Nightly, Catholic in America. We're working with a major polling company and a highly experienced media research firm to spotlight what Catholics in this country think about the church and its leaders, about American politics and its leaders, as well as how Catholics and Catholics' issues are covered by major news outlets and smaller publications in battleground states. We'll roll out and analyze these findings between now and the midterm elections as part of an ambitious undertaking to take the pulse of the Catholic community in a way that's never quite been done before. We begin tonight with an exclusive EWTN News Nightly poll by McLaughlin and Associates, done for this network on what Catholics think about some of the hot topics in America, starting with the president.
We asked, do you approve or disapprove of the job Donald Trump is doing as president? Out of all of the responses, 42% said they approve, 56% disapprove. But take a look at these numbers. For churchgoers, those who go regularly, 52% say they approve of President Trump and the job he's doing, 47% disapprove. And for not regular church growers, Christmas, Easter, maybe once a month, 32% approve and 65% disapprove, 65%. Now, the next question we asked, if the U.S. election for, if the election for U.S. Congress were held today, would you be more likely to vote for the Republican or Democratic candidate? 37% overall said they would go Republican, 50% Democrat. And it's nearly even when we look at people who attend church regularly. 44.9% said they'd vote for the Republican, while 44.5% said the Democrat. And lastly, oh, for not regular church attendees, 28% said they'd vote Republican. 56% of those who do not go to church regularly said they would go with the Democrats. The survey was taken last Thursday before the Brett Kavanaugh and accuser hearing. A global gathering of church leaders opens with a visibly moved Pope Francis. Diamo loro il nostro caloroso benvenuto. The Holy Father choked up during his homily today, and he welcomed two Chinese bishops taking part in the Synod on Youth. It's the first time they're joining such a summit since a landmark deal between the Vatican and China. Francis celebrated Mass in St. Peter's Square with more than 200 priests, bishops, and cardinals from all over the world who are participating. Vatican correspondent Juliette Lindley joins us from Rome. Juliette, what is the Pope's message as the Synod begins? Lauren, Pope Francis urged the bishops to dream of a future free of the mistakes and sins of the past. The Holy Father prayed for the bishops to guide the young with experience, but also to rekindle the, the gift of dreaming and hoping that young people have. He prayed for God's help to ensure that the church doesn't allow itself from one generation to the next to be crushed by our shortcomings, mistakes and sins, he said. Well, this month-long synod is opening amid outrage over the abuse scandal with new revelations about decades of wrongdoing in the U.S. and Chile and Germany and elsewhere. That has sent confidence of Pope Francis's leadership here in the U.S. to an all-time low. That's right, Lauren. A survey by the Pew Research Center released on the eve of the synod found that only 31 percent of American Catholics felt that the Pope was doing an excellent or good job in addressing the abuse issue. Now, that's down from 45 percent in January, and in 2015 it was 55 percent. So today, Francis didn't refer directly to the scandal in his homily, but he did urge the Synod members to, quote, reverse situations of uncertainty, exclusion, and violence to which our young people are exposed. And he also called on the bishops to get rid of any attitudes that alienate them from young people. He said when church leaders don't connect with young Catholics, they are, quote, orphans without a faith community. The Pope says that that leaves them devoid of a sense of direction and a meaning in life, Lauren. Juliet, this afternoon, Pope Francis had some advice to guide participants. Tell us about that. The Pope made an appeal to the Synod members not to gossip or have a critical attitude. He encouraged them to listen, and he said only frank dialogue can help the church grow. The Holy Father also denounced what he calls the scourge of clericalism. He's referring to the attitude that only bishops and priests have authority and they misuse that authority. Now, the Holy Father also made a point of telling the older participants not to underestimate the abilities of young people. And he reminded young people, on the other hand, not to brush aside the older generation as out of touch with reality, Lauren. Juliette Lindley, EWTN News Nightly Vatican correspondent. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Chile's Catholic Church apologizes for conduct 
guidelines for priests dealing with children. The published document was signed by Cardinal Ricardo Izzati, but was later removed after a flurry of criticism. Izzati was questioned today for allegedly covering up years of abuse. Victims and activists say they are shocked by the lack of sensitivity in the country. A court in Poland rules a Catholic order must pay nearly $300,000 to a victim of clergy abuse. A priest from the order was convicted in 2008 of abducting and sexually abusing a 13-year-old girl. The ruling coincides with the release of a movie about clergy misconduct. In its first weekend, Klerg, which is Polish for the clergy, clergy set a record with nearly one million viewers. A lawyer takes the case of an American pastor under house arrest in Turkey to the highest court in that country. A representative for Andrew Brunson appeared today before the Constitutional Court. The 50-year-old pastor was arrested in December 2016 and charged with terror-related crimes. Brunson strongly denies the claims. It may take several months for the high court to reach a verdict. The pastor faces 35 years in prison. Aid is slowly making its way to earthquake and tsunami struck areas in Indonesia. Affected areas remain without power. In a rare move, the country has appealed for international help. Food and water has not reached the hardest hit areas of Sulawesi Island. Bishops in Ireland call on the government to do more for the country's homelessness crisis. In a letter issued Monday, bishops urge steps to be taken to make housing more affordable. There were more than 9,500 people homeless in August, an 18 percent increase since last year. Ireland's home ownership rate is lower than the EU average. There is plenty more on the newscast tonight. Coming up, what caused more than 220 million cell phones to buzz this afternoon? Plus, why the Trump administration is ending a treaty with Iran that began in the 1950s. Welcome back. Nearly every cell phone in America buzzed this afternoon. The Federal Emergency Management Agency was testing its presidential message alert system. It's similar to an amber alert, but cannot be turned off. The alarm reached around 225 million phones and also televisions and radios. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says the United States is canceling a treaty with Iran signed in 1955. He says the move is decades overdue, adding Iran is using it for their own political purposes. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby has more from the State Department. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. Secretary Pompeo's announcement comes just hours after the United Nations highest court ordered the U.S. to lift some of its sanctions against Iran. They claim the, section, uh, they claim the sanctions violate the Treaty of Amity, which is an economic and diplomatic agreement signed during the Eisenhower administration. But Pompeo says Iran's claims under the treaty are absurd. The choices that are being made inside of Iran today to use money to foment terror around the world, to launch ballistic missiles into airports throughout the Middle East, to uh, arm uh, proxy militias in Iraq and in Syria and in Lebanon, those are dollars that the Iranian leadership is squandering. Pompeo also says Iranian militants are a threat to Americans in Iraq. It's why he says he's removed all Americans from the consulate in Basra, where violent clashes have been ongoing. Pompeo is headed to North Korea with plans to meet with Kim Jong-un on Sunday. He's expected to lay the groundwork for a second summit between Kim and President Trump. Some State Department officials are doubtful North Korea really is working to give up their nuclear weapons, as is former U.N. weapons inspector David Albright. I would argue, based on what we see, it's, it's the same level of operation that it's been for the last couple of years. But, but North Korea has not been forthright about what its nuclear capabilities are. Albright says at this pace, North Korea can still produce about three to five nuclear bombs a year in secret. Likely that's an issue Pompeo will be talking about with his counterparts this weekend. The secretary says he will be traveling to Japan first on Saturday, then to North and South Korea on Sunday, and finish off his quick trip to Asia with a stop in China on Monday. He says the focus of this trip will remain denuclearization. Lauren? Wyatt, I remember talking with Secretary Pompeo earlier in the summer about China's negotiations with the Vatican. 
concerning the appointment of bishops, and I interviewed him in July. Is he going to talk about that issue or other religious freedom related topics while he is there? It's not likely, Lauren. I talked with the State Department official about that today. He says the secretary is, of course, well aware of the various human rights violations and accusations of crackdown on churches by the Chinese government. But they would not say really specifically whether they get into detail on those topics or if they would be brought up at all during this particular trip. When I asked in more detail, they simply told me that he's going to be talking with his counterparts about bilateral topics. Lauren? Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reporting from the State Department. Thank you, Wyatt. There's more to come on the show tonight. Up next, we hear about a nationwide initiative for women seeking life-affirming health care. A princess reportedly has been removed from the line of succession to the British throne after she became Catholic. Princess Alexandra of Hanover, a member of the royal family of Monaco, was baptized Lutheran. The 19-year-old converted to Catholicism to follow in the footsteps of her Catholic mother. Since the British monarch is the head of the Church of England, an heir to the throne cannot be Catholic. Women in the United States seeking life-affirming medical care are starting to have options around the country where they can find comprehensive, high-quality treatments for all ages at pro-women's health care centers. Joining me now is Christine Ocurso, Executive Director of the Consortium of Pro-Women's Healthcare Centers. Welcome to the program. Thank you. First, before we begin, you have great fashion sense. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so do you. <laughs> Wearing the same covers. colors. For our viewers who may not be familiar with what you call PWHC, Pro-Women's Healthcare Center, tell us, tell us about it. Well, it's a consortium of centers nationwide offered li offering life-affirming women's health care. And these providers have been doing this for decades. What does that mean? Yes, that means that they're, do they're offering health care that's to restore the body. So every woman from 9 to 99 years old, everybody can come and get great health care. I want to put up a map of the United States just to show our viewers where exactly these the PWHC centers are. Um, you have centers all across the country, but you're looking to to add. Tell us uh, where, how many you're adding, and how big you want it to become, how big you think it can become. Sure, we just launched this year. We have seven certified centers. We have five now in the application process, and we have over 100 people on a list to be able to add um, to even more. We want to be able to add them because women need the good identification of real women's health care and not the narrative that's owned by someone else in this country at this time. Oh, that would be Planned Parenthood, I'm mm -hmm. guessing, right? Yeah. So what you're saying is life-affirming. So if you come in as an OBGYN and say, I want to be part of this consortium, I'm going to get this gold stamp of approval that I can mm -hmm. put on my mm -hmm. shingle, what do they have to do? So this is all based on standards of care for women. Okay. So the standards speak to the woman's body, mind, and soul, the whole woman. And so therefore, there's a list of standards that are very comprehensive. And if you comply with every single one of those standards, you'll get the gold seal of approval. You don't require centers to be faith-based, however, uh, but much of the role is spiritual care, as you're talking about. How much um, does that play into this? Well, I don't think any healthcare prov provider would say that spiritual is not part of a human being's life. And so therefore that's the reason why the spiritual aspect needs to be identified. And what that means at each center is a little bit different. Definitely it's not faith-based, it's for everyone in the country who can comply with them. You're a practice administrator, so it means you administrate for an OBGYN group, Morningstar in Gilbert, Arizona. What do women who come in and use those services tell you? Mostly, I mean, and everyone who comes in says they really love the approach to healthcare. It's very personal and compassionate. Mm -hmm. And since we've been doing this consortium nationwide and uniting, we hear that from every center. You don't offer abortions, no, no pill, no. nothing related to uh, birth control. No. And this is a place where women can come and know that they are going to get the care that is life affirming. Right, very comprehensive, holistic, natural women's health care. Thank you, Christine Ocurso, Executive Director of Pro Women's Health Care Centers Consortium. Thank you, Lauren. 
For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Let's keep in touch online. Follow me at Lauren Ashburn on Twitter and Lauren Ashburn EWTN on Facebook. Good night and God bless you.